Welcome to the Full Audio Books Short Stories channel. The author, Sandy Ingram, holds the print, digital and audio rights. As I sat, waiting for the aircraft to back away from the terminal and take off, I couldn't help but feel frightened and furious with my family for dedicating my life to an idea, a religion, or whatever the jihad was. I was the third child in the family, but what did that have to do with anything? Tell me, I had obligations to an idea that wasn't basketball, hip-hop, or Jay-Z. Didn't make any sense. Yet, there I was on a plane, headed to some camp in a foreign land I knew little about, just because I was the third child. And what about the CIA? I'd informed them of my travel plans. They said they'd be in touch, but there was no sign of them anywhere. I felt like everybody on the plane knew what I was up to, and there was no way the man sitting in the seat next to me couldn't hear my heart pounding in my chest. I know he suspected me of evil doings, and why shouldn't he? I jumped with every unexpected sound and waited for the moment when the police would storm the plane and arrest me. I loved my parents, but I didn't want to kill or be killed to further anyone's agenda. That's why I contacted the CIA, to let them know what my father had done. My name is Ed Heen. Computer science was my major in college. Our professor showed us how typical government security systems and firewalls worked. We studied the Internet security for the Department of Defense, the NSA, and even the IRS. Sending an email to the CIA wasn't that difficult. It was a matter of routing the email properly to the correct department. In the encrypted message I sent to the Central Intelligence Agency, I included my American identity and information about my flight and told of the instructions given to my father for me to follow. I explained my father was relenting to the third child rule and allowing the jihad to dictate my life. Just when I believed the agency had written me off as a nutcase and sent my message straight to spam, I received a text message. I didn't recognize the number. All it said was, follow through with the scheduled plans. We'll be in touch. I remembered the morning I received the message. It was like it happened only yesterday. I was elated, frightened, and guilty at the same time. I was happy the agency responded to the son of an immigrant. I only wanted to live the American dream, yet I felt guilty. I betrayed my religion and my parents and allowed the Western world into the inner workings of the Muslim religion. That text was sent to me over six weeks ago and there had been no word from the CIA since that time. I leaned back in my seat aboard the aircraft and closed my eyes. Security before boarding the plane had taken forever, or maybe it just seemed like forever to me. I wasn't sure if the x-ray machines couldn't see my deceit. I suddenly remembered the attractive white woman with the short black hair who ran into me when I was walking to the gate. She's about to fall and I reached out to catch her. Thank you. I'm so sorry, she said over and over to me. I thought little of the incident. She reminded me of Maria, my American girlfriend of three years. Maria was not from the Middle East, but I like her just the same. I remembered when I first met her in my English class during my freshman year of college. She was friendly, beautiful, and funny. Maria's mother was Mexican-American, and her father was from India. I smiled every time I thought about her true culture, and how I introduced her to my parents as the daughter of a man from the Middle East. As long as Maria didn't begin speaking Spanish, my parents would never know the difference. I was sure my life was about to end because of the jihad training. I couldn't help but worry that I would be forced to do something terrible. I wanted to talk to my parents about the situation, but my parents weren't open to a lot of discussions. They gave the orders and I followed the orders. I'm not gonna lie, 
I was worried about my future, my life, and my family's life if I didn't follow orders. Being born in America, raised in America, and educated in America, I had no reason to believe that I was anything but American. I felt torn between the country I was born in and the religion I was raised in. I was always the mild-mannered kid who obeyed my parents' every request. My parents made every effort to honor the American way of life, or so it seemed. My mother was a professor at the university and taught Arabic. My father was a civil engineer who worked as an independent contractor for the city, state, and federal agencies. My oldest brother, who was born in the Middle East, was attending medical school, while my older sister was awaiting her marriage to a wealthy Muslim. So why was I sitting on a plane headed to Egypt for some sort of jihad training? All I wanted to do was finish college, get my degree in computer science, and work in the computer intelligence community. As a child, I was treated differently than my older brother and sister, yet I remained loyal to my parents and their hidden cause. My father, more so than my mother, was the silent force behind me, obeying the third child rule. My father kept saying it was only to better the way of life for Muslims worldwide. I could tell that he too was worried that the jihad had turned to violence during his absence. And when my father received instructions, which included packing desert boots and night goggles, this deepened my father's concerns. Suddenly, I jumped out of my skin when an unfamiliar telephone ring came from the left pocket of my shirt. I pulled the phone out cautiously, looking at it in total surprise. This wasn't my cell phone. Where was my cell phone? My thoughts immediately flashed back to the woman who I kept from falling in the airport. I lifted the phone to my ear. Hello? A female voice on the other end of the line spoke. We have eyes on you. Can you hear me? Yes, I replied as I looked around in confusion. The woman's voice was cool and professional. When you reach your destination, they will take your personal possessions, including your cell phone. This cell phone has been programmed with the numbers we want them to have. The voice paused for a moment, as if to give me time to digest the information. You will find a small chip in the back of this phone. Remove the chip on the back of this phone and insert the chip into the underside of your arm, just below your wrist. The voice paused again. Do you understand? Yes, I said, although I wasn't entirely sure I was telling the truth. The insertion will leave a small cut on your skin. Place the microchip just under the skin Remove the prongs and dispose of them in the aircraft lavatory. Another pause. Do you understand? Yes. Ask the stewardess for a band-aid. Do you understand? Yes. Good. She will provide you with the cream and a band-aid to put on your arm. If she doesn't give you the cream to make the cut invisible, make a scene and be escorted off the aircraft. Curse and scream until they remove you. Do you understand? Yes. After you rub the cream over the small incision, wait 30 minutes before placing the band-aid over the cut. Your flight will not take off until you have followed these instructions. Yes, I replied, hoping that I wouldn't have to get escorted off the airplane. Cut your old cell phone off and dispose of it in the aircraft lavatory when you dispose of the prongs. Please follow these instructions now. Do you understand? I hesitated for a moment and then remembered that the voice said they had programmed my new cell phone with the numbers they wanted the jihad to have. Yes. We will be in contact. The phone went dead. I immediately flagged down a stewardess and asked permission to go to the lavatory. Sure, sweetie. Is there anything else I can get for you? She said with a southern drawl. Yes, please. May I have a band-aid? I asked. The stewardess smiled. Why, of course. 
The stewardess returned with a small packet that contained cream and a band-aid. I followed all the instructions given to me. I used the sharp prong on the back of the phone to cut into my skin just below my wrist. I was careful not to cut my wrist and thought about all the times I'd considered suicide. On returning to my seat, I felt much better about my future. At least now, I wouldn't be arrested and thrown in jail for training with the jihad. Just as the voice said, once the microchip was under my skin and the cream applied which made the small incision almost invisible, the aircraft was cleared for takeoff. I was amazed at the power of the CIA and one telephone call. I thought about Maria just as the flight lifted off the runway. I hoped that my text message would help her understand why I had to leave so suddenly. The flight to Cairo was uneventful. Once the flight landed, I waited in the baggage claim area for my contact. I grew tired of waiting but continued to follow my parents' instructions. After nearly three hours of waiting, I decided to call home to make sure I was in the right place at the airport. We're so happy you called. The actual camp training was to be in Libya. There was a drone strike near the training camp, and the training has been canceled. My mother said excitedly, Mother, I started to speak, but my mother cut me off. Use the ATM card we gave you and check into the hotel where we usually stay for a couple of nights. Visit the University of Cairo to find out about enrollment, then return home. He can be back in school by next week. She hung up. I looked at the phone. It was almost like my mother was an extension of the call from the agency. I did as my mother instructed me to do. I called the hotel my parents stayed in when they visited Cairo, Egypt. And lucky for me, that had a room available for two nights. The ride from the Cairo airport to the hotel was unpleasant. Miles of traffic jams. Car fumes and smog clogged up my lungs. The pollution was so bad, I couldn't stop coughing. When my cab finally reached the inner city, I saw faithful Muslims put their mats on the ground while they knelt to pray right on the sidewalk. There were people everywhere. My research informed me Cairo's population was around 17 to 20 million, making Cairo one of the largest cities in Africa. The fact that the protests were happening near the center of town didn't help matters. It was wall-to-wall people, and getting to my hotel was a major task for the cab driver and myself. After checking into my hotel, I was concerned about my stay in Cairo. Unfortunately for me, my so-called training was right in the middle of Egypt's second uprising. I made every effort to stay away from the protest and the rock and bottle throwing. It was like nothing I had ever experienced. Egypt's police had just stormed the Muslim Brotherhood and killed dozens of young protesters, men and women of my own age. There were confusion, gunshots, and frightened people everywhere. The armed guards searched me at the front door of the hotel to be sure I didn't have any weapons. They were burning buildings, loud noises, and streets filled with people. All I could think about were the national treasures, which were in Egypt's museums. The history of the world, so to speak, was in Egypt. What would happen if these irreplaceable treasures were destroyed? Finally, I was able to disappear into the luxury hotel my mother suggested. The hotel encouraged guests to remain within the complex unless they had a pre-planned tour, but drivers with the tour companies were scrambling to find alternative routes to get tourists to popular attractions outside of the city. The motto was to keep the tourist dollar in Egypt, even if there was a major riot. I postponed my visit to the University of Cairo and went to the hotel's front desk to ask about a short cruise on the Nile River. I'd visited Egypt several times as a child but never cruised the Nile River. This activity was left for my parents and other adult family members. As I approached the front desk and waited for my turn to speak to a hotel employee, I decided not to leave the hotel after all. There were dozens of tourists from almost every country in the world trying to get to the airport. 
There was a sense of urgency in most of the tourist voices, which led me to believe the streets of Cairo were far from safe. As I turned to take the elevator back up to my room, I recognized my father's brother, who hurried to me and kissed both of my cheeks. Quick, we must get your things and get you out of here, he whispered. How did you know I was here? I asked. I had been told that no family members were to know I was traveling to Africa. I couldn't confide in or contact anyone for fear they would want to know the real reason for my visit, according to my father. Your father told me what happened, he explained. As he pushed me onto the elevator, we have a reason to believe the Americans know of everyone who was coming for the training. We must get you out of here and change the stamp on your passport. I was at a loss. Changing my passport wouldn't matter because my name was on the flight manifest. Not to mention that I told the CIA when and where I was going. My uncle must have heard my thoughts. We changed the flight manifest, he said. Your name was removed. Once inside of my hotel room, my uncle got on the telephone while he motioned me to pack my belongings. I was concerned about the checkout, but my uncle signaled that he was handling everything. Once my bag was repacked, my uncle rushed me to the service elevator where he and I rode to the ground floor. We slipped out the service entrance of the hotel. There was a Mercedes-Benz waiting for us, which sped away immediately after we climbed into the back seat. My uncle took the cell phone from his ear long enough to ask me for my passport, which he then handed to the man on the passenger side in the front seat of the car. Ten minutes later, the man gave the passport back to my uncle, who handed it to me. I'm taking you to a heliport, which will transport you to a private jet, which will take you to Tel Aviv. There you will board a plane to New York and make a connecting flight to California. If anyone should ask you, you went to Tel Aviv. You were never in Egypt. Do you understand? I looked at my uncle in amazement. They were those words again. Do you understand? Yes, I understand, I replied. I was fully aware that my new cell phone was tracking my every move, and the CIA knew exactly where I was, but I said nothing. My uncle looked at me for a long moment before speaking. You are one of the chosen ones for our people. Where you go, the darkness will follow, and from that will come the light. This is your destiny. Be safe and be silent. I understand, uncle, I said. But I really didn't understand. What did he mean when he said I was one of the chosen ones? The car finally came to a stop at an open field just outside of Cairo. There was a sleek helicopter waiting, and I hurried to the helicopter as my uncle stood and watched. I'd never ridden in a helicopter before, and I felt a certain rush of excitement. At this small airfield, there were several jets, but I could tell the airfield was private and not well kept. I boarded the aircraft as instructed by the helicopter pilot. A half hour later, I was making the change from the helicopter to the private jet. I had no idea where I was or which country I was in. I wondered if my family knew that I had contacted the agency and was secretly arranging my death. In the Muslim world, sometimes people just disappear. If the family says nothing, neither do you. The private jet landed safely in Tel Aviv. I had even more questions. Why would my uncle and my father's brothers send me to Israel to exit the Middle East? What was wrong with departing from Egypt? I took my phone out of inner coat pocket and saw there was a red light blinking. I could only guess the CIA was tracking me and wondering what I was doing in Israel. I carefully put the telephone back into my coat pocket. Once I exited the aircraft, I went through a makeshift customs area. The guard asked me a few questions. I became frightened when he asked me for my passport. I hadn't even looked at the changes the man in the car made. I had no idea what my U.S. passport said or even if it looked professional. Whatever it said or didn't say, I was told that there was a car waiting to take me to the airport. There is a revolution in Egypt, yes? The guard asked me. 
Yes, I believe so, I replied. The guard responded, Remember, you were never in Egypt. I was taken by total surprise to hear an Israeli guard say to me the exact words my uncle spoke earlier. Bewildered by the events of the past two hours, I felt overwhelmed. Who was I? Why was I important? And what did my uncle mean when he said I was one of the chosen ones? Who was I that my family of Palestinian descendants and my so-called enemy would speak the same words to me? Once inside the car on the way to the Ben Gurion airport, I looked at my passport. I saw a seal that I wasn't familiar with. On the page where there previously was a stamp confirming my arrival in Egypt, there was a blank page. The entire passport looked normal. The stamp which the man placed onto one of the pages was a seal I'd never seen before. Just then my phone rang. I slowly took the phone out of the inside pocket of my jacket. Hello? The voice at the other end came through loud and clear. It was my uncle. Adheen, I wanted to be sure you're safe. Yes, uncle. I'm on my way to the airport to catch my flight. My uncle hesitated for a second and then cleared his throat. Adheen, you are a special boy. You were born under the son of Abraham, the father of Ishmael, son of Hagar and Isaac, son of Sarah. You represent both the Palestinian people and the Israeli people. For you and others like you to be safe, there must be peace in the Middle East. Your mother's ancestors are Jewish. You must never ever share this information with anyone. My uncle hesitated for a long moment, but I said nothing. You may have dark feelings at times, just ignore them. These feelings are the emotions of others who have not obeyed their higher calling. You were born to bring peace to all sides involved. There are those who want you to be used for one side only. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I did and assured my uncle that I understood. Let what I'm saying to you be silent on your lips. Speak of this to no one. Just as I was about to respond to my uncle, he hung up. I thought about what my uncle said over and over. There were others like me in the world, and I wasn't crazy. The thoughts of suicide and death would come and then suddenly disappear were real, and somehow I understood what my uncle said to me. As long as I was alive, there would be hope for peace in the Middle East. For now, this was more information than either my father or mother had given me. My parents never discussed their lives before Egypt, and I knew better than to ask. I always had a feeling my grandfather on my father's side was behind some questionable activities, which is why my father and mother moved to the United States. Did my grandfather find out my mother's ancestors were Jews? Is that why my parents left Palestine and then Egypt? Was this the reason my father was honoring the third child rule and allowing the jihad to take control over my life? I thought about my father. He was secretive and received many calls, which resulted in him leaving the room. He said little about his so-called popularity, other than to complain that the jihad telemarketing programs were getting out of control. He complained that every other day they were calling for money. It was no secret the Muslim community was filled with telemarketing campaigns to raise money for questionable activities. It was widely believed this was one of the reasons for the increase in government surveillance of emails and telephone calls by the NSA. Being self-employed, my father was more accessible to these types of telephone campaigns. He often threatened to sell his business and become an employee instead. I remember my father was overly concerned about my trip after he received the instructions. Travel with heavy desert boots and night vision goggles. These are the instructions which made my father nervous. A peaceful workshop or seminar of prayer would not require such items. There were few people he could ask about the workshop for fear of trusting the wrong person. As close as the Muslim community was, cells and the formation of cells is classified information.
There was a one hour difference in the time between Egypt and Tel Aviv. I noticed that my cell phone updated itself upon my arrival in Israel. There was only one reason I could think of that would explain the actions of my Palestinian uncle and his organization. They wanted my passport to show I visited only Israel, a friendly country with the United States. I arrived home safely and was elated to be back. I managed to escape the jihad training camp and prayed that they would never contact me again. My older brother confirmed what I suspected. My mother was indeed Jewish. She was the love child of a Jewish man and my Palestinian grandmother. My mother was raised as a Palestinian. She was the result of a forbidden love affair which was hidden and never discussed. When my father found out, he insisted that he married for love and refused to leave my mother. This is why my parents left the Middle East and moved to America. On the morning that I was to return to school, I was excited and in a hurry. I grabbed my cell phone off the kitchen counter and hurried out to catch the bus to make my bus connections to get to school. I wanted to surprise Maria at lunchtime. It wasn't until I was sitting in my first class of the day that I realized that I had taken the wrong phone off the kitchen counter. I wanted to text Maria to tell her to wait for me at lunch, but the phone I picked up was my mother's. What a coincidence. Her phone was exactly like the phone the CIA slipped into my shirt pocket. Later that evening, my mother and I exchanged phones. Neither of us said a word. We both feared my father would learn of our actions. Both my mother and I realized we could meet with an untimely accident if our actions became known. Betrayal of this magnitude was rarely forgiven. We allowed the Western world into Muslim affairs. We betrayed the confidence of not only our religion, but our family. Perhaps my mother could survive if the secret was known, but certainly not me. If you enjoy the short stories created for Sandy's YouTube channel, please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when new audiobooks are uploaded.